thing we know about this QRS, look how narrow it is, okay? Now, and then we look over here at this one, and it's going in the opposite direction. Now, this one, you might be able to make an argument that this may or may not be ventricular. Why would I make that statement? Can you repeat the question? No. It's hard to say if, if it's ventricular or junctional. Why? So let me repeat the question. These three in here, you might be able to make an argument that these are not ventricular. Sam, why? The QRS complexes aren't ventricular. You look at the width of the QRS complexes, okay? We can't really tell because we don't have anything to grade it on and there's no scale there to look at. But again, if it's ventricular, it's got to be wider than 0.12 seconds, okay? So these are triplets, and if we had four of them, what did I say we would call it? Sure, run of VTAC, okay? So, as we're looking at causes, okay, this is a pretty important slide. You might want to keep it, all right? The most common that we've got up in there is myocardial ischemia. We have a decrease in the oxygenation of the ventricular cells, okay? Second thing that come into play here is that we get increased sympathetic tone. Now, that sounds impressive. What does it mean? Increased heart rate, yeah. So we can, when we have an increased sympathetic tone, again, depending upon whether it's primarily dealing with the atria or the ventricles, remember when we looked at these right here, definitely your heart rate is going to be faster. So it could be there. Again, hypoxia coming in, which leads right back into our ischemia up here. Idiopathic causes. Idiopathic is a billable medical term that goes, I don't know, okay? I don't have a clue. It may be normal, it may be pathological, but we've done all of our tests and we don't know, okay? Acid-based disturbances. We'll cover a lot about acid base when you get into advanced cardiology, okay? The body likes to be within a very a narrow pH range. And when the body gets out of that pH range, things begin to not work well. One of the things that can happen is that we can begin to see things just like this, okay? And then lastly, electrolyte imbalances. I wanted to, not that one, uh, not that one either, this one. Okay, so just kind of put it in your back pocket. When you see... A T wave like this. There's something going on with potassium. with potassium. We're not entirely sure just yet whether it's too high or too low. I'm hoping by the time those of you that are taking this class roll into the advanced sequence in the fall. By the way, when we get to the end of class, remind me to make an announcement about entrance exams. We're going <laughs> to introduce a handheld device that will let you run very limited labs on your patient so that, number one, we can be able to run a lab value and find out if one of the um, cardiac enzymes, if it's elevated, like the troponin level goes up, regardless of what you see on your, on your uh, EKG, that's an indicator your patient's having a heart attack. And then the other thing that we could run is that we could run a potassium lab, okay? so that right there by the bedside, you would be able to figure out what's going on with this particular patient. So we've got the device, so hopefully we'll introduce it within your, within your, uh, your, your class. But it can become from electrolyte imbalances, and particularly within electrolyte imbalance, we're primarily going to be looking at an, uh, an imbalance either in the sodium and or the potassium within the heart. Sam, do you have a question or are you just stretching? Okay, no problem. All right. So as we're looking at this, some of the things that we're going to be concerned about of, of really looking at our patient is that if we have more than six PVCs a minute, okay? So if we have six PVCs on a six-second strip, that gives us cause for concern, all right? RMT phenomenon. Who can remind me and tell me what RMT phenomenon is? It's basically when um, 
T wave gets too close, um, excuse me, the R wave gets too close to the T wave and um, it can basically cause the heart to stop. Yeah. So basically what you will see is a patient will begin having PVCs and if it looks like it's occurring on the downslope of the T wave, remember that's the relative refractory period. If we get an impulse that hits on that, it puts our patient into ventricular fibrillation. Nice thing about it is, if we got a patient hooked up to a monitor, we lean over, we shock the patient, and almost always it will convert the patient. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he won't go back into that again. So, R on T phenomenon. Couplets or runs of ventricular tachycardia, especially when VTAC starts and stops, okay? Multifocal. Okay, multifocal PVCs are a concern. And then if you've got a patient sitting here that's having PVCs and chest pain, that should raise your little spidey senses, okay? We've got something major that is going on. Yes? Um, why is the multifocal more uh, severe than unifocal? Great question, okay? Who wants to try to answer that for it? Why are multifocal PVCs more concerning than unifocal? Based on the different What's that got to do with price of eggs? You're right, but tell me more. Noise of ventricular uh, dilation is easier. Uh, they come from different sites, so if they would come from the same site, it would be confused on. I don't know. Okay, Sam. Could it be, could it be increasing the risk of RIT? Potentially, but now remember, what did I say was the number one cause of PVCs? Ischemia. Ischemia, okay. So if we've got multiple sites, multifocal PVCs, and especially the more shapes we see, the more concerning it, it is, that tells us we have a larger area of the heart that is probably hypoxic, okay. So we can get that critical mass of hypoxia, within the heart, which leads to a patient having a heart attack and dead tissue. So that's one of the reasons why multifocal would be concerned. And the more shapes you see, the, the as my friend from Tex, Texas would say, the more worse it is. So is that the same instance as like some of the other like premature contractions that fix the hypoxia problem you could potentially fix? Yeah. It? Yeah, and one of the things that, that, that you will see with these particular uh, patients, I can remember, again, way back in the dark ages when I was going to paramedic school, you know, and, and our cardiac monitor was that little edge sketch thing. Anyway, um, seriously, my cardiac monitor had a screen that was that big, okay? Google LifePack 5 and, and look at it sometime. I think it's in a display case. I, we had one, so take a look at it, okay? You guys are so spoiled. You got your fancy dancy little monitor, big monitors. Anyway, I digress. Um, like the first like monitor where you have to like actually hook up to like the freaking I know what you're talking about. They didn't have stickers, they just shoved like spikes in. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get back here. So so the big thing that we're looking at here is that when we see those multifocal PVCs, we're we're really concerned about the degree of hypoxia that's going on. And like I was getting ready to say before Devin so rudely interrupted me, oh, paramedic instructor once told me that, you know, you're going to see a patient with PVCs. You're going to get all, all excited and say, I'm going to get to do something really cool here in a minute. So you put your patient on oxygen and you start your IV and then you look over at your patient and that oxygen has corrected the problem. <laughs> okay. That's good for the patient. Okay. But you'll have to save your, your 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 skills for another day. So yeah, so treat the hypoxia as far as when you're when you're going in there. Now typically, when you are assessing a patient who's having multifocal PVCs, even though we count the rate, when you are feeling the PVCs, you generally are not able to feel them. Why? Because the heart does not contract as hard as it would be if it's if it's normal, okay? So typically, we're not going to treat these unless our patient is symptomatic, and you're going to hear that over and over and over again, especially when you get into advanced cardiology and you take advanced cardiac life support, or when you get into pediatrics, 
as the students are doing Monday and today, they're taking pediatric advanced life support. You look at your patient and you treat your patient when they are symptomatic, okay? Now, when we see... Could you go back to that last slide for a minute? Yep. So, when we now begin to see multiple PVCs, okay? By multiple, I'm saying that's pretty much all that we see. Let me know when you're done. Then we're going to be looking at a rhythm known as ventricular tachycardia. I've seen that, and it's pretty wild. It is wild. It's, it is wild. It's weird to see. Yep. So, you good? Yeah. Okay. So, basically, what we're looking at here is VTAC is considered to have four or more consecutive PVCs. If you have four or five PVCs and then it stops and converts, we just simply call that a short run of VTAC, okay? Now, when you give your report, the physician or a nurse is gonna to wanna to know, Jack, well, how many did you see? And that's when you can tell them and you can put it in your report as well. But basically what you've got going on here is that you have this very wide looking, this very bizarre looking um, ECG that has really nothing that looks like um, a normal QRS. There's no P waves in there and there's really no T waves either. They're there, you just can't see them. Now this is important and burn this into your brain. You can have VTAC with a pulse, or you can have VTAC without a pulse, okay? And we'll talk about the treatment of each of these in just a, a probably a week after next, because I'm hoping to, to do um, pharmacology next week, okay? When we're looking at this, the exact same etiologies come into play for VTAC as it comes in for PVCs. So what we want to do, Jack, is that when we begin to see these happening, we want to try to treat the problem if we can identify it. If our patient is ischemic or hypoxic, we're going to increase their ventilation. We may have to bag our patient. We may have to put our patient on higher levels of oxygen. If it is increased sympathetic tone, we may be able to give our, medicine, our patient a medicine to kind of calm that down to, to slow it down. We can give them a medicine that's known as amiodarone. Old medicine, it's still used today. We can give them some lidocaine, all right? Within your acid-based disturbances, we're a little more, uh, as well as with the electrolyte imbalances right now, we're a little more constrained as to what we can do with that. But there are some things, especially with acid-based and ventilation, that will help to offset that. So here's your criteria for PV, I mean, for, uh, for VTAC. Generally, your rate is going to be greater than 150, and it can be even faster than, than 200. Usually, you will see VTAC being a regular rhythm, okay? So as you count, and you can count either from the top of the R to R or from down at the bottom and count R to R's, Really, not sure which one is which. If as you as you plot those out, that's going to be regular as you're as you're going through. There's no P wave, there's no PR interval, and your QRS is always going to be. Um, let me back up. Is almost always going to be wider than 0 0.12. Again, there's sometimes, especially when you get up into the 220, 240 range, that QRS becomes a lot more narrow, and you're you're not exactly sure of what you're what you're looking at and what you what you've got. Okay. That's where the treatment with adenosine comes in, Claire, and we can, we can diagnose that. Everybody got this? Okay, if I go on. I'm still writing a couple oh, Okay. I don't even have my phone with me. I will give everybody 100 for a quiz grade because my computer went off. I had <laughs> And then I'm going to kill the person you call. <laughs> you only get one per class, okay? Right. They call back, you don't get another. I'll take it. <laughs> okay, so as we're looking at this, again, the problem with VTAC is that we do not have good cardiac output, okay? We have really poor cardiac output. 
Again, Bannon, when we're looking at the VTAC, we immediately go back to our patient and we assess our patient. You'll hear it again. Don't treat your monitor, treat your patient, okay? If your patient has a good blood pressure and they're awake and alert and maybe they feel a little dizzy, but they're not having any chest pain, they've got a blood pressure of, say, 110 over 78, and the uh, skin is pink, warm, and dry, we're just going to watch that patient. We're not going to treat them, all right? But if they begin to go downhill, then we would go in there and, and um, uh, treat them. Again, this comes back to my second bullet here. Your treatment for this patient is going to be dictated by whether it is perfusing or non-perfusing, and knowing whether it's perfusing or non-perfusing is going to come from your patient assessment, all right? Got to watch these patients really, really closely, okay? Because it can deteriorate into VFib. VFib never, this is one of the few times, ventricular fibrillation never has a pulse. Your patient is in cardiac arrest, okay? What's that? <laughs> so I was trying to quote your little saying that you always say. Yeah. Remember, I said almost never or, all, you know, uh, all, almost, there's almost never and always or never in, in medicine. Occasionally there is, okay? <laughs> no. So as you're looking at this, and again, we'll talk about VFib in, in just a little bit, all right? Now, what is this? I'm going to assume it's DTAC. It is VTAC, it like but that. what's up with, I mean, it doesn't look like that. It's different mythology. Tell me more. Smoke or something. Say it again. It looks like it's got some PVC in it. Maybe. So this is a specialized type of ventricular tachycardia. Oh, this is that. I'm not, I, can't, I don't know how to say it. It's like torsades. Torsades. Tors uh, it's called torsades de points. There, yeah. Torsades de points. And it, it's French for turning on the point. So if, if we were to take this and turn it sideways, it would resemble, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those little windmills that spin around that have different parts to them that can really mess with your mind if you stare at them too long. But what you see here is you, you begin with VTAC that is really, really large in amplitude, and then it begins to get smaller in amplitude, and then it gets larger and smaller, and that pattern is re re repeated, okay? This type of VTAC is called polymorphic, okay? Not multifocal but polymorphic. Now, what does the word polymorphic mean? No, poly multiple, shapes. Shapes. So many multiple ways. shapes. Say it again, Martina. Many, multiple, many what? I don't know. Yeah, many, 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 what did you say, Elizabeth? Many morphology. Yeah, many points. It's coming from multiple places in, in the heart, okay? This is always concerning. Regardless of what your patient looks like, we're always going to be concerned about this. Because remember, it's coming from multiple points in the heart. And as a result of that, we want to treat it because what is the other rhythm, okay, that is a non-perfusing rhythm that comes from multiple points, in, in, particularly in the ventricles. This is coming from the ventricles. But what's the other rhythm, Matthew, that is coming, non-perfusing rhythm that's coming from multiple spots in the ventricle. Be fit. You're right. So if we don't take care of this particular situation, it's going to deteriorate into this rhythm right here. Okay? I, I took that as you were going to say, like, which other rhythm is a non-perfusing rhythm? I was going to say asystole. <laughs> asystole is another non-perfusing rhythm, but we have no electrical activity in asystole. The other thing to keep in mind about this, ladies will see this more in you than you will in men. Okay? Don't know why. It just happens. Okay? That's what makes you special. All right? Yeah. So uh, you can see it in, in, in all patients, but it typically is shown more in, in women. If this deteriorates, then it goes into ventricular fibrillation. Within ventricular fibrillation, 
you got thousands of cells that are trying to fire primarily within the ventricles. There's no atrial activity going on. There's no junctional activity that's going on. And this is a last ditch effort for the ventricles to try to get something started. The problem is it doesn't. Sam? So is there an explanation for why the, I think it's like multifocal, but why is it in that pattern of increasing PRS? And then it's it's because, because it gets into a pattern within the heart of coming from different cells. So the fact that these are different sizes tells us that those are coming from different cells. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is, like, why isn't it, like, tall, tall, short, tall, short, short, This is different tall. electrical outputs, isn't it? Why is it regular like this? It's on a conduction pathway. Remember, again, number one reason for, for VTAC or, or ectopics is hypoxia. So you have a track of the, of the, of the heart that is hypoxic. And many times what you will do is you'll find that track that is hypoxic contains the nervous pathway of either left and right bundle branches or goes it out to the, to the Purkinje fibers. Okay. So that would be the primary reason why. Okay. Right. So with this, this again, this is one of those uh, few times when we, I can say always, okay, there's, there's no pulse for this particular patient, all right? The, the definitive treatment for this patient is defibrillation, okay? We'll talk more about defibrillation okay, as we're looking at. Again, with ventricular fibrillation, if we, if we do the um, five-step, you can say no to everything. No rate, no rhythm, no pacemaker side. Well, let me back up. Yeah, you got all kinds of pacemaker sites coming from the ventricles, but you have no P waves, no PR interval, no QRS, okay? Again, your patient is dead unless you act quickly. Now, one of the things that you can look at is you can have what's known as coarse V-fib, which is if you've got to have a, a flavor of V-fib, coarse V-fib is what you want, or you can have fine V-fib. Basically, it is the amplitude of the fibrillation waves that are going through here, how tall they are. We give a medicine, you'll learn about it next week, called epinephrine that will help to make it more coarse. A patient that has coarse V-fib has a greater chance of survival than a person who has fine V-fib. Why would that be? Which means what? Say it again. There's no stroke volume going on with this. So there's no, there's no cardiac output. No. Their heart is already better set than it would be if they were starting out with like fine V-fib. So what does the amplitude, Matthew, tell us about what's going on from an electrical perspective? You get more electrical activity. Bingo. So you have more electrical activity, okay? When it goes down and now it becomes fine, it's just a short step away from this rhythm, asystole, okay, in which you have no electrical activity. So the less electrical activity that you have, the less likelihood that you're going to be able to resuscitate somebody. Resuscitation from asystole is pretty much less than 5%, okay? So we want to keep our patients from getting into that particular uh, that that particular situation, as far as looking at it. Again, when we look at the causes of asystole or the the, the outline, because we want to make it consistent, basically you can put your five steps down there, and you can put no out from each one of them. There's nothing there. Now, one of the things I want you to be really careful about sometimes. Students, especially new, will look at that and they'll see this kind of this movement here and um, they'll call that fine V-fib. That is not fine V-fib, okay? That is a systole. Last question before the day and then we'll talk about uh, entrance exams. What might be causing that movement? Lead placement. Say it again? Lead placement. Lead placement could be. Good. What else? Patient this patient's dead. He better not be moving. <laughs> Well, the truck's moving, isn't it? Truck's moving, okay. So the body may be moving, okay. What would be some other reasons of why the body would move that shouldn't scare you? Artifacts of like 
you're trying to do something. Now, typically, if you're doing CPR, you're going to see CPR spikes on there that are artificially generated. But when you've got this, if, if this is one of the reasons why you don't want to touch a patient when you're using an AED, because it may pick up some of your rhythm and interpret it as being the patient's. When you're, as, as a paramedic, you, we don't really worry about that, so we can interpret that, okay? Real quickly, any questions about this? We still